Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm joined here today by Ian Livingston, the Chief Constable of Police Scotland, and by Professor Jason Leach, our National Clinical Director. Uh, let me start, as always, with a statistical update. Uh, as at nine o'clock this morning, there have been 14,969 positive cases confirmed of COVID-19, which is an increase of 113 from yesterday. A total of 1,257 patients are in hospital with COVID-19. 874 of them have been confirmed as having the virus and 383 are suspected of having it. And that represents a total decrease of people in hospital of 61 from yesterday. And that includes a decrease of 35 in the number of confirmed cases. A total of 50 people last night were in intensive care with either confirmed or suspected COVID-19, and that is a decrease of one since yesterday. I'm also able to confirm today that since the 5th of March, a total of 3,508 patients who had tested positive and been hospitalised with the virus have now been able to leave hospital, which is, of course, very good news. Unfortunately, though, I also have to report that in the past 24 hours, 24 deaths have been registered of patients who had been confirmed through a test as having COVID-19, and that takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 2,245. Let me emphasise again that these numbers are not and should never be seen as simply statistics. Each of them represents an individual who was loved and who is currently being mourned by their friends, family and loved ones. And I again want to send my deepest and heartfelt condolences to everyone who has suffered a loss as a result of this virus. I also want to thank, as I always do, our health and care workers for the extraordinary, incredible work that you continue to do each and every day. Uh, now, there are two items I want to briefly cover today. Um, the first is to reflect back on the route map that we published yesterday on how and when we might ease the current lockdown restrictions, while, of course, continuing to suppress this virus, which is so vital. As at 10 o'clock this morning, I can tell you uh, that more than 100,000 of you have viewed the document on our website. And my apologies to those who tried to do so yesterday and found that the demand had uh, made the website struggle. Uh, but I'm glad that so many people have managed to look at it. And, and my thanks to you for doing that. I would encourage those of you who haven't yet had the opportunity to go online and read it. And of course, if you have any views on it that you want us to know about, please feel free to send them to us. Uh, the document, of course, set out the different phases in which we'll aim to ease lockdown. The steps that it sets out are, are by necessity, gradual and incremental, uh, and we will monitor them carefully as they take effect. And we will have to change our plans if the data, evidence or our knowledge of the virus uh, changes. And let me stress, though, that that could include lifting restrictions more quickly than we otherwise uh, think we can do. And I also want to stress today, and this is a really important point, that none of the changes uh, that we talked about yesterday are yet in place. During this bank holiday weekend and into next week, the current lockdown restrictions are still in place. And that is important for me to stress, because the one thing that would slow down our lifting of lockdown is us taking our foot off the brake too quickly now and allowing the virus to start to spread rapidly again. However, uh, on a more optimistic note, as things stand, uh, we do intend to enter the first phase of easing restrictions from next Thursday, the 28th of May, so now uh, less than one week away. And by then, I hope uh, we will still be seeing progress in the fight against the virus, but also by then, we will be in a position to start with our test, trace and isolate programme, test and protect, as we're calling it. And as you've heard me say before, that is a key tool for us in continuing to keep the virus suppressed as we start gradually to ease these restrictions. Now, as I said yesterday, uh, not all of the phase one measures will necessarily be introduced immediately uh, next Thursday, though I hope that most of them uh, will be or within a day or so after that. Uh, but we'll have to make a judgment at that time. But I want to reiterate some of the changes that I hope we will see from next week uh, so that you uh, know what uh, you're able to look forward to. 
Um, as the document sets out, uh, more outdoor activity will be permitted. There's a strong emphasis in the first phase on outdoor activity because one of the things we are learning about this uh, virus is that the risks of transmission outdoors, although not zero, absolutely not zero, are nevertheless lower than the risks of transmission indoors. Uh, so you'll be able in this first phase to sit outside or sunbathe in parks or other open areas. And as long as you stay two metres apart, you will also be able to meet outside with people from another household, including in private gardens. Uh, now, let me be clear, because it's a, a question that I, I know has been asked, that doesn't limit you to seeing just one specific household during this phase. You can see different households, but we are asking you only to meet with one at a time. Uh, we're also not intending to put a five mile limit on the distance you can travel to, for example, sit with your parents in their garden. But we are asking you to use judgment. And increasingly, as we come out of lockdown, I'm going to uh, more and more be relying on you to exercise the good judgment that I know you will. Uh, if, for example, you have to travel a long distance to see a relative outside, uh, you're more likely to perhaps go inside the house to, for example, uh, use the bathroom. And we don't want you to go inside others' houses in this phase because if you are infectious, maybe without knowing about it, you risk leaving the virus on surfaces inside the house and that would pose a risk uh, to other people. Uh, and particularly if you're visiting elderly relatives, that is a risk we don't want you to take. So please use your judgment and continue to have uppermost in your mind the need to protect those you care about, even if that might mean staying apart from them for just a little bit longer. Uh, so as well as those changes, uh, some non-contact outdoor leisure activities will be allowed to restart uh, from uh, the end of next week, such as golf, tennis, bowls uh, and fishing, uh, croquet as well, as I was asked about uh, in Parliament, uh, subject to appropriate hygiene and physical distancing. Uh, people will be able to travel, preferably by walking or cycling, uh, to a location near their local community for recreation. Uh, but here we are asking you to stay fairly local. Five miles is not going to be a strict limit, but it is intended to give you a guide. Because what we don't want uh, in this phase is for people to congregate at tourist hotspots. Because crowds of people even if they're trying to socially distance, brings more risk that we don't judge it is safe to take at this time. Waste and recycling services will resume, as will many outdoor businesses. The construction industry will be able to carefully implement the first steps in its restart plan. Other industries that might not resume straight away, but in the next phase, phase two, will be permitted in phase one to start to prepare workplaces. Outdoor retail outlets, Garden centres in particular will be allowed to reopen and very importantly we will also start, albeit gradually and carefully, to resume NHS services that were paused as a result of the pandemic. Uh, schools will not reopen until the 11th of August but during June teachers will return to prepare for the new term and also for a, a different model of learning. Over the summer an increased number of children will have access to critical childcare and we intend to provide, where it's possible, some transition support for children who are going into primary one or moving from primary seven into secondary school. Childminders will be able to reopen during phase one. And over the summer, we want uh, and hope to see all early years childcare providers uh, open again, subject, of course, to being able to follow necessary health measures. The route map uh, provides more detail on all of these steps and on each subsequent phase. Uh, and it also outlines a bit more about how they work alongside our test and protect approach, which, as I said a moment ago, will be vital in helping us to control the virus. Uh, in the days ahead, uh, before next Thursday, we'll publish more detailed advice and information uh, for you, the public, as well as guidance covering key sectors of our economy, travel and public transport. Uh, and that's a really important part of preparing for the move into phase one so that there is as much clarity as possible about what we are saying is able to be done and what we're still asking you not to do at this stage. However, let me just emphasize a key point again. None of the changes I've talked about today are yet in place. We can only begin to implement them if we continue to suppress the virus. And that's why, for the moment, current lockdown restrictions remain in place.
And that brings me to the final issue I want to cover, which is about our support for people in dealing with lockdown. And it has particular relevance, I think, as we mark the end of Mental Health Awareness Week. Uh, we know this crisis is causing increased anxiety and stress for probably everybody in the population. Uh, we also know that because of the lockdown, many people are cut off from their usual support networks, uh, whether that's your family, friends or the wider community. And the problem is, of course, particularly acute for those of you who are isolating completely or shielding. The Scottish Government has been trying to take action uh, throughout this to address this issue. Uh, today, I can tell you that since lockdown began, we've provided more than £8 million to projects that are specifically aimed at tackling social isolation. Uh, that money comes from our wellbeing fund and it's now supporting around 350 projects in every part of the country. And the services that are being provided include phone calls to older people who are self-isolating, food parcels and special packs for families, help with digital technology for those who need it and respite care for parents of children with additional support needs. So I want to take the opportunity today to say uh, a heartfelt thank you to everyone working across the third sector, uh, to all the organisations and, and volunteers who are involved in providing these services. Your willingness to help others in what is the most difficult of times for you as well as for others is hugely appreciated. And... I want to stress one of the key messages of Mental Health Awareness Week. It is OK not to feel OK and help is available if you need it. So I would encourage any of you uh, to uh, look for help if you do feel you need it. The Clear Your Head website, which is clearyourhead.scot, brings together all of the different uh, information about the support that's available. Now, I want to close today uh, by just emphasising the point I've made a couple of times already, that for the time being, the restrictions of lockdown remain in place. The Chief Constable is going to say a few words in a moment. For now, let me end uh, just once again by reiterating what those restrictions are. Uh, except for essential purposes, exercise, going to essential work that can't be done at home, or getting food or medicine, you should stay at home. You can exercise more than once a day, but please stay more than two metres away from other people and don't yet meet up with people in other households. Please wear a face covering if you're in an enclosed space like a shop or public transport and wash your hands thoroughly and regularly. And finally, if you have symptoms or a member of your household has symptoms of COVID-19, isolate completely. Um, I know how hard these restrictions are and I absolutely know that hearing me talk about easing them, particularly as we head into a bank holiday weekend, will make all of this seem even tougher. But we do need to stick with it for a few more days. Because if we do, then I really hope that this time next week when I'm standing here telling you all to have a nice weekend, I'll also be telling you to enjoy for the first time in a long while seeing some of your family and friends over the weekend, as long as you do it outdoors and remember to stay physically distant. So everybody's been magnificent so far. Please stick with it for a few more days so that we can take that first step on the journey back to some kind of normality. Uh, thank you all very much uh, for your cooperation and I'll now hand over to the Chief Constable to say a few words before handing over to Professor Leach. Thank you, First Minister. Well, as Chief Constable, I mean, I. I also know that, that many of us uh, are feeling the frustrations and fatigue from the restrictions and sacrifices which have been necessary uh, during this emergency. And during this time, the police role has been to support the need for physical distancing and act actually support the public health imperatives. I express my thanks, respect, regard to the people of Scotland for working with the police service over these last uh, few weeks. Uh, collectively, collectively, uh, we have done uh, very well in responding to the coronavirus uh, and again I thank the public for that and that cooperation between the police and fellow citizens is vital uh, to the relationship that the service in Scotland has uh, with, with its public. A significant period where freedoms of movement, freedoms of action, freedoms of association have all uh, been limited uh, and again I pay tribute to the public uh, for enduring uh, the limitations on uh, their freedom. The consent and support shown by the overwhelming majority of people in Scotland, I think, is based on the very uh, strong and established bond of trust that exists between policing and the public in Scotland, established over generations. We in Scotland police by consent, 
with a commitment to public good and well-being, as well as law enforcement. And actually, yeah, I've been uh, reinforced and, and um, pleased to reflect upon that during the pandemic, there are some suggestions that that bond, uh, in fact, has actually uh, been strengthened. Now, that's a credit not only to the public, but to the officers and staff who are working with their fellow citizens in the shared mission uh, to reduce the spread of the virus. And again, I would thank all officers and staff and their families uh, for their commitment to public service. Now, as the First Minister has made it very clear, uh, because of the self-discipline and the personal responsibility demonstrated uh, by the overwhelming majority of the people of Scotland, we are now in a position where we can look forward look forward to a period uh, and phases of transition. And as we progress through these phases, inevitably, uh, we will be moving from explaining, encouraging and, where necessary, enforcing restrictions to a greater emphasis on guidance, a greater emphasis on advice. But in truth, this has been our approach throughout the emergency, to rely on the common sense and personal responsibility of the people of Scotland, to do the right thing, to protect the NHS and to save lives. Now, not to avoid a criminal justice sanction, but to do that because it's the right thing to do. Now, I am clear that we will continue to police with courtesy and fairness and continue to police with the support of our communities. And it's right, of course, that we can look forward to the summer months and getting out and about. But it is absolutely vital to stress this morning that the rules in Scotland have not changed. So officers will be out and about on proactive patrols, explaining the rules, encouraging cooperation. And where absolutely necessary, as I've said right from the outset, as a last resort, we will enforce the law. I want again to stress that Police Scotland is here to help. We are here to help our fellow citizens to keep them safe in all aspects of their life, 24 hours a day. And again, as the First Minister outlined in her uh, opening uh, remarks, we do know that some people are particularly vulnerable in private and virtual spaces, that for some people being at home is not a safe place and it's been a significant concern and priority for policing during this time. We've been working extremely hard with many partners, many partners in the third sector uh, uh, and again I would echo the First Minister's comments in terms of their commitment and the work that's been carried out uh, to ensure that victims are given the vital support that they need and that they deserve. If you need police assistance, if you need our support or intervention, if you have concerns about someone else, contact us. We are here to help you 24 hours a day. We are here to make sure that those in need, those who need support, those who are vulnerable, get that support and get the intervention and the support they need. We are here to ensure fairness we are here to ensure equity and the rule of law. So I'll close in stressing a fundamental uh, message. The rules haven't changed in Scotland. Please st stick with it. Stick with it. Keep doing what you've been doing. Uh, and uh, we will have uh, some weeks ahead to look forward to. Thank you very much. Look after yourself and look after your families. Thank you very much, Chief Constable. Um, before I hand over to Professor Leach, can I take the opportunity to thank our police officers and staff across the country? Um, every Thursday night, we applaud our NHS and care staff and key workers, and in my mind, uh, as I do that, are also uh, our police officers and staff across the country who have been such a vital part of this national effort. So my grateful thanks to all of you. Uh, Jason. Uh, thank you, First Minister. So now that we're talking about easing lockdown, I'd like to remind everyone of the really important things we need everybody to do to keep reducing the spread of coronavirus. Five basic things have not changed and will not change next Thursday. In fact, they will become even more important. Everything that we do from this point forward is about reducing the spread of coronavirus, even as we ease lockdown. So number one is remember to regularly and thoroughly wash your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds or use an alcohol-based gel. Why should you do this? Because washing your hands with soap and water or using hand rub kills the virus, and that may be on your hands. Number two, keep at least two meters distance between yourself and others when you're not with your own household. 
if you're in a crowded area, such as public transport or a shop, wear a face covering. Why? Because when someone coughs, sneezes or speaks, they, sm they spray small liquid droplets from their nose or mouth, which may contain virus. And if you're too close, you can breathe in that virus. Number three, avoid touching your eyes, nose and mouth. Why? Because hands touch many surfaces and can pick up virus. Once the virus is on your hand, it can transfer to your eyes, your nose or your mouth and you could become infected. Number four, make sure you cover your mouth and nose with your bent elbow or a tissue when you cough or sneeze and then dispose of that tissue and wash your hands. Why? Because droplets again spread virus. So by stopping the spread of the droplet, we protect people around us. And finally, number five, clean all your surfaces regularly with a household cleaner. Antibacterial wipes or such are effective. Why? Because it's possible to catch the virus from surfaces. And if you touch an infected surface and then touch your mouth or nose, you could possibly catch the virus. And just to remind you, finally, the symptoms of coronavirus are a continuous new cough, a fever, and or a loss of a taste or smell. And if you have developed symptoms, you should stay at home for seven days. You should go on to nhsinform.scot where you can book a test. And if you worsen or don't recover, then you should phone 111 and the National Health Service will be there for you. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, Jason. Right, I'm going to open for questions now. Uh, first one is from Ewan Petrie from STV. Uh, thank you very much, First Minister. Um, You've said the test and protect strategy is key to controlling the virus during the easing of the lockdown. Can you update us on how many of the 2,000 contract tracers have now been recruited and how close you are to the target of 15,500 tests a day? Um, we are uh, very close to being uh, able to reach the capacity of 15,500 uh, tests a day. That's processing 15,500 tests a day between our NHS labs and the uh, Glasgow University lab, uh, Lighthouse lab. Uh, let me stress in all of this that we, we may have to go beyond that in future because our capacity will need to adapt to whatever the prevalence of the virus is. Um, on contact tracers, there are uh, 660 in place right now. There are uh, around 750 in process. These are people who were identified from a previous trawl uh, for potential candidates and they're at various stages of the appointment and training process. Um, and all of that, of course, is before we process an appoint from the around 25,000 expressions of interest that have been received as of the this morning and today is the closing date for the uh, applications uh, from the advert that we placed a couple of weeks ago. Um, so all of that is on track and, and we continue to, to make progress. Again, a bit like um, my uh, answer on the, uh, the tests, we've got to be mindful of not getting too fixed in our minds around these numbers. It's important we build up to that capacity, but as of the end of the month, we may well not need all 2,000 uh, contact tracers and we may well not need all of the testing capacity, uh, but we need to have it uh, in case we need it in the future. And of course, we may have to go beyond the 15,500 and the 2,000 in future. We, we have to remain flexible in uh, our ability to scale up depending on the requirements that the virus places on us. Of course, the, the more we suppress the virus, the more we keep infection levels low, uh, the more able any test uh, and protect system uh, is to control it and, and keep it controlled. But all of the things Jason has just advised you to do are really important as part of this to keep infection levels as low as possible. Uh, Katie Hunter from BBC. Um, hello, everyone. I would like to ask a question about care home testing, please. Um, First Minister, on, the May, on May the 1st, you announced all staff in a home where there had been cases of COVID would be tested whether or not they had symptoms. Um, we've learned that NHS Lanarkshire has been advising White Hills Care Home in East Kilbride, where there have been COVID-related deaths, that staff should be symptomatic before being tested. Now, there's absolutely no criticism of the staff at White Hills um, at all, but I understand NHS Lanarkshire wasn't applying the May 1st guidance to homes where there'd been an outbreak before May the 1st. Now, I appreciate this week's updated guidance means all staff in all care homes should now be tested, but my questions are, should NHS Lanarkshire have been testing staff without symptoms at White Hills from May the 1st? And if the answer to that is yes, how concerned are you that this wasn't happening in a home with a, an ongoing outbreak? 
Well, my answer to your first question in general, because obviously I, I don't know the detail of, of, of your Lanarkshire case there, is uh, all care homes uh, and all health boards should be following the policy we set, and you have outlined the policy in terms of testing staff in those circumstances, whether or not they have symptoms. So uh, that that is the policy and it should be implemented. And uh, if it's not been implemented in any uh, particular care home or any particular health board area, that is something we follow up and, and try to rectify. And I'll hand over to Jason because I'm also about to give him uh, the task of following up that particular case this afternoon and making I sure that any discrepancy between the policy and practice is resolved as soon as possible. I had written down the name of the care home before you did so. The, the only other thing I would add is, remember, what we're trying to do here is manage outbreaks, new, new outbreaks. So when there is a case in a care home, the guidance is that we will then test all of the staff in that care home and all of the consenting residents in that care home. I, I, I need to emphasise this test is quite unpleasant to those with dementia or those who are very distressed already, but as far as possible, test all the residents and all the staff once there is an outbreak. If that guidance hasn't been followed, then we will tell NHS Lanarkshire again to follow it. Thank you. Um, Fraser Knight from Global. Minister, this afternoon we're expecting to hear an announcement from the UK government around international travellers having to self-quarantine for 14 days when they arrive back in the UK. And police in England are being given powers to do up to 100 spot checks on people at their homes. So my question to you is, um, an already struggling airline industry, how do you plan to, to mitigate the impact that this will have on some flights not being able to return? And just a question for the Chief Constable, if I may as well, um, will police in Scotland also be doing um, these spot checks? And could this, is this another thing that officers could really be doing without? Um, I'll hand off to Chief Constable in a second, but let me uh, deal with the question from a policy perspective. First of all, there have been uh, very intensive discussions between the uh, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland and the UK government in, in recent days. I uh, took part personally uh, in one of those uh, last Sunday uh, around the, the development of this policy. It's a policy I am very supportive of. Um, I you know, regret that we're in a situation where we have to impose quarantine on people coming into the country because we're a, an open and welcoming country. But as we go into the next phase of dealing with this virus, that is going to be really important to make sure we're not seeding uh, the virus into the community as we're trying to suppress it here. Uh, we, as I say, have been in those discussions. We'll see the detail, the fine detail of what the UK government uh, announces later on today. Uh, we will have to introduce our own regulations here in Scotland to give effect to aspects of this policy. And, and obviously, we will we'll consider these points of detail as we see exactly what the UK government announced uh, later this afternoon. Um, enforcement and, and if and how it is enforced will be one of the things we are looking at carefully um, and mindful of uh, the practicalities from, from the police. So these are things we will consider and take decisions on here in Scotland. The Chief Constable and I have had a, a quick chat about this already this morning, but I don't think on that we would uh, say too much more before seeing uh, the detail of what the UK government proposes and then making judgments ourselves as to whether that detail is is appropriate here or whether we would want to, to do certain aspects of it in, in a different way. But the, the intention here is one that is shared UK-wide. Chief. Yeah, thank, thanks, First Minister. Yeah, I have um, um, clearly very aware of uh, this kind of developing uh, policy issue. Certainly in the early uh, days, i.e. maybe sort of last week, a uh, couple, couple of weeks ago, uh, the expectation I had that, that if there was a role for the police, it would be a minimal role uh, in terms of seeking to enforce uh, the, the quarantine. Initially, it would be self-policing, people volunteering to do that, backed up. Uh, with some uh, engagement from uh, health protection professionals and, and clearly the border force uh, at uh, points of entry. So the, the act, exact role for the police service uh, re remains unclear. As the First Minister said, we are very conscious of, of what impact that might have on, the, on the, the crucial relationship between our fellow citizens and the police service, uh, something that, as I stressed earlier, I, I, I think is very close. Um, so we will have to look at uh, what proposals uh, are coming from uh, London, and then we'll, I will we'll be discussing that with uh, the First Minister and her officials uh, to determine exactly what, if any, the, the police role uh, would be. OK, thank you. Um, Lindsay Hanna from Bower. 
hold our station North Sound. There's been no consultation on the phased plan, which they say will destroy hospitality in Scotland and could result in as many as 100,000 job losses in hospitality by the end of June. They've said the Scottish Government's plans rest on whether businesses will have an outdoor space or not, and not whether they're actually able to operate safely with social distancing guidelines in place. So what would you say to this, and will there be more support available for these sectors during the phased reopening? Well, there's been widespread and ongoing discussion between the Scottish Government and different sectors of, of the economy. I will certainly ask the uh, Tourism Secretary, Fergus Ewing, to uh, speak to the UK Hospitality uh, Organisation to make sure that they are involved in this. Uh, but we have had very good discussions with uh, sectors in the tourism, uh, organisations in the tourism sector as well as in, in other sectors. And we'll continue to do that. I mean, what I'd say, first of all, is none of us want to be in this position. Tourism is you know, one of the most important and valued sectors of the Scottish economy. It doesn't just uh, earn a lot of revenue for our country. It's so critical to who we are as a country and it is absolutely uh, massively valuable to our, our brand, our, our international reputation. I want to see our tourist sector up and running uh, with all of the, the wonderful hospitality businesses as quickly as possible. But we have to protect life and health and we're having to do things right now that would have been unthinkable just a few months ago. And uh, we are also having to think about how we adapt. How do we allow businesses to get back into operation, but in a way that is safe for their workers and for those who use their services? These are, are tough discussions, uh, but they will be ongoing. And along the way, uh, we will try to provide as much support as possible, financial and support in, in other ways. I chair every Friday morning the uh, economy subcommittee of the Scottish Cabinet. And you know this was a point that Fergus Ewing uh, was raising as he does uh, assiduously on behalf of the, the tourist and hospitality sector. So these are issues are absolutely uh, high up in our minds and on our agenda. And we will continue to work through these things in a sensible, orderly way as possible that, that Ultimately, it's about doing what I've spoken about so often before, finding this new balance, this new normal that allows us to get back to some kind of normality in our everyday lives, but in a way that keeps this virus suppressed. Because we cannot, if we allow this virus to take hold again, then you know what we have experienced over the last few months could be even worse in future. So none of this is going to be easy, but we will work through it together. And that includes with the, the tourist and hospitality sector. Tom Eden from PA. Thank you, First Minister, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to ask about education. I know your route map's dependent on controlling the virus, but the one clear date in there is the 11th of August when schools will resume. Um, that's in stage three, uh, at a stage where children still won't be allowed in other relatives' homes. Um, but a key part of this plan is homeschooling for pupils. Um, I know the Education Secretary said that employers need to be flexible and more people will be working from home. But what happens to pupils with parents who have to be at work, sort of those on the NHS front line, shop workers or, or people who are teachers themselves? What's your specific plan for them? Uh, and just a quick one for the Chief Constable, if that's all right. Um, I was just wondering uh, how many early release prisoners uh, have been arrested or charged since they've been released? Okay, I'll hand over to the Chief in, in a second. On, on schooling, look, we're, we're trying to give as much clarity uh, as possible to parents. I think it was important we did that yesterday and to young people themselves who want to know when they're going to be back in school with, with their friends. But recognising there's a lot of detail that we need to continue to work through. It's why it's so important that, again, subject to health advice, we have the agreement that teachers will go back uh, to work in June to start working through what the next term looks like. Uh, what this new model of learning will look like. And we will, over the summer, be uh, discussing with uh, parents' organisations, teacher organisations, unions, local authorities, um, employers, about how we try to work in a way that, I'm not going to stand here and say takes away all of the difficulties and challenges people will be facing, but tries to align all of the different things we're doing uh, well enough to, to, to mitigate uh, these issues. One of the things we said yesterday, which I mentioned again today, is that over uh, June and, and the summer, we want to increase the number of children who have access to the, the, the hubs that key workers and, and vulnerable children have been able to access right throughout this crisis so that we can see perhaps more children of key workers or, or the kind of uh, workers that have no other options able to, to access that support. I, I come back to this point, not to not to put a downer on, on everything, because we, we finally have a little bit of hope and, and optimism in front of us, but none of this is going to be easy in the weeks or months to come. And, and there's no point me... 
uh, trying to pretend otherwise. But, you know, we've, we've worked our way through a lot of difficulty in the last three months and we've, we've shown that we can do things that we never believed we could do. We've made progress in areas that would have just been unthinkable before this crisis. So with, with a will, with support of government and other partners and with a, a recognition that we're all trying to reach the same aims, then we will work through some of these practical challenges. Um, and... You know, life is not going to be exactly the same for a wee while, uh, but we will get back to some kind of normality. I said yesterday we will communicate directly with all parents over the summer so that they've got a better understanding of exactly what schooling is going to look like and some of the support that we will try to put in place to help parents with uh, the fact that it will not be back to school absolutely as normal. Uh, Chief, do you want to take the second point? Yes, thank you. thanks, First Minister. The, the policy of uh, releasing... Uh, prisoners early uh, from uh, the prison sentence was, was one that was subject to very, very uh, widespread and, and rigorous uh, debate and, and preparation. Cabinet Secretary for Justice ha has made it very clear that it wouldn't include uh, people convicted of, of sex offences, it wouldn't include people with a history of domestic abuse, and that there would be uh, risk assessments made uh, against each and, and every individual that was released. And again, uh, the reason for that it was for the public health Im imperative uh, that, that uh, existed. So, um, as of yesterday, um, I think there was almost 300 individuals who have been uh, released early uh, back into the community. Uh, and actually, um, there have only been, uh, as of yesterday, two individuals uh, who have come to our notice uh, for, for re-offending. Now, the release of prisoners was never without risk. Uh, there was a recognition around that. Um, we've been working very closely with the Scottish Prison Service, very closely with the third sector and other agencies in the communities who provide uh, support for people and their families uh, when they're released from prisoners. Um, so there have been instances uh, of reoffending, but they've been very, very low uh, given the numbers involved. OK, thank you. Scott McNair from The Scotsman. Uh, thank you, uh, First Minister. Just kind of following up on the, on the point about the blended schooling approach, which um, will be um, introduced, um, it will require a, a new approach from employers, as you've uh, alluded to, things like more flexible working in this um, four-day week idea. I, I'd just like to ask what you're doing to um, actively encourage employers to make this happen. Will the public sector, for example, take a lead by um, implementing a four-day week? Uh so we are uh, seeking to have these conversations with employers, with business organisations. And yes, you're absolutely right. On so many of uh, these uh, employment practice issues, we would expect the public sector to uh, show leadership. Now, I, I mentioned a, a four-day week yesterday as an example. I, I didn't intend to put all of the focus on that, but as an example of the need there is over this next period to think differently about how we do things because the world is not going to be the same as we were used to before lockdown. So flexible working, particularly while we're in this blended home school uh, education scenario, is going to be even more important. We will, and again, this is a point I should stress, even as we move into phase one, phase two, phase three, we're still going to be asking people where possible to work from home, uh, which obviously puts different uh, responsibilities and, and poses different challenges for people um, and while we're doing all of this right now out of a sense of necessity um, we also need to back to that theme of of cautious hope and optimism we also need to think are there opportunities in here to just change the old ways of doing things and and do things better having more people working from home with the right support of course or working more locally helps us reduce uh, our uh, climate emissions and meet our climate targets uh, giving people more flexible working opportunities perhaps holds out more work-life balance and quality of life opportunities. So we're doing all of this because we have to right now, but some of it might be good to do anyway. So there's lots of challenges and difficulties in all of that. And as government, uh, we, we don't have all the answers and can't make all of these decisions for employers across the country, but we will do what we can to facilitate these discussions and bring to bear whatever support we can. Uh, Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. Hi, I was just looking to get a bit more clarity, really, on when people are going to be able to see families if their families don't live particularly close by. As you've said, there's various logistical issues with that in terms of going to the bathroom, etc. Would, would it be correct in saying that that would happen in perhaps in phase three when accommodation providers open so you can 
maybe get a hotel room or an Airbnb ne near your parents' home. And just on a, on a just on a clarification as well on, on what penalties you're going to set for breaching the uh, quarantine rules the UK government are announcing this afternoon, whether that will be at a, at a similar level to the, to the penalties for that exist already for breaching the social distancing rules. So on that last part, we'll consider that once we see the detail of what the UK government announces and we'll, we'll come to a view on that and, and make that known uh, as soon as as we do. On, on the first point, I mean, I said yesterday, and I'm, I'm very conscious of this, as we move gradually uh, from a situation that we're in just now, and we are still in it, let me remind you, of strict rules that just say don't do most things, into a phase where we're being, uh, trying to be more flexible and, and allow people to do more and have more interaction. I'm going to more often be standing up here saying, please use good judgment. And remember that it's all about protecting people you love. Um, we'll set out some uh, as much detail ahead of next Thursday or on next Thursday ahead of these changes coming into force as we can, just to give people a sense of parameter. But we can't legislate for every single individual circumstance. So I'm not standing here saying we're going to put a distance at limit on how far you can travel to see your, your elderly parents in their own garden, but we will have to ask you to exercise judgment. If, if your parents live so far away that you can't uh, get there and back in one day or that it is going to be really difficult for you not to go into the house for the reasons that I've already spoken about, then yes, maybe you do have to wait till another phase. But if your parents live a bit closer, not within five miles or ten, but you can get there and back in the one day and, and you can make other arrangements for other, other requirements, that is different. Now, this is much harder for people because the, the, the lines might not be so firmly drawn. But one thing I've learned over the past uh, few weeks is that people are capable of exercising judgment and good sense and also acting responsibly because this is about you know it's not me saying if, if your parents live in Inverness don't go because I'm telling you not to go it's about saying if your parents live in Inverness and you live in Glasgow then what it will require for you to practically visit them might mean you putting your parents at risk and therefore don't do it for those reasons so it is about judgment and it will increasingly be about judgment but I think you know, I've got a lot of confidence people will do the right thing because people have been doing the right thing. So that's my general answer, but we will try to lay out as much of the parameters of this as possible to guide people's uh, application of judgment as, as we go into this next phase. Uh, Mark McLaughlin from The Times. Hi there. Um, moving on for Jason today. Um, Public Health Scotland released some figures on Wednesday, which showed a, you know, a very welcome flattening of the curve of hospital admissions. But I was quite surprised to see at the start of that curve, um, the hospital admissions seemed to be three times higher than the confirmed cases at the time. Now, Public Health Scotland said that this, these were people who were in hospital at the time who subsequently caught coronavirus and then that positive result was retrospectively applied to their day of admission. Um, is that what's going on here? I mean, why, why were hospital admissions three times the size of positive results before lockdown? Okay, I'll ask Jason to have a go at that. We may have to come back to you with some of the detail of that, but Jason can I think that's right. Answer. Mark, I was going to say, I'll come, I'll come back. I'll, I'll look at it in, in detail and we will come back. I'll ask Public Health Scotland to give me some advice. My, my instinct from what you say, and uh, the First Minister gets concerned when I talk instinctively, perhaps, is that when we were treating people for respiratory disease at a time when we had quite a lot of flu, quite a lot of colds, we were treating them smartly and well and clinically well and then we were testing them and those tests some of them would come back positively many of them probably had community acquired coronavirus and then that would be added in we also now know of course from the last few weeks that what we would call clinically nosocomial infections infections that spread inside institutions has not been zero so so there will be some people as in our care home sector in our hospital sector who have had coronavirus inside the hospital. And that, that happens with C. difficile, it happens with MRSA, it happens with all nasty infections inside institutions. So some of it will be that and then retrospectively added to those admissions. 
But more than that kind of generic answer, I'll get, I'll get some more detailed analysis of those, of those data. OK, we'll come back to you uh, on that, Mark. Vivian Aitken from the record. Hi. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, I don't know about you, but when I saw the crowds on the beach at Portobello the other day, it gave me the fear. And I have to say, if we are having relaxed restrictions and people are crowding to beaches like that, how are we going to prevent them doing that when we do ease up restrictions and allow people to go out and sit in parks and sit in beaches? Um, what can we do to, to stop this mass arrival at, at public places? Well, I'll, I'll hand over the Chief Constable and we have a, a perspective on this that he, he wants to share with us, but let me just give you my perspective. I, mean, I, I felt a bit frustrated when I saw those photographs, not because I didn't understand why people wanted to go to the beach on what I think has been the hottest day of the year so far, but because I don't want the, the progress that everybody across the country has made to be put in jeopardy. Um, now, I'm sure people weren't doing that because they deliberately wanted to flout the rules. They probably were taking care to socially distance. I, I get all of that, but we need to really just take so much care that we don't go backwards in this because we'll all end up under lockdown for a lot longer and unfortunately more people will die. Now, as we move into a different phase, there will still be uh, rules in place and regulations that the police, through the very responsible way they've been doing, will be able to enforce uh, if necessary. And some of the changes we're about to introduce uh, will require changes to regulations and, and some things might get tighter, some things might get uh, less tight, but we explain that as we go. But as we go into this next phase and subsequent phases, as I've just been talking about, more of what we are asking people to do will be guidance rather than uh, the letter of the law. And that makes it all the more important that people do the right thing and think very carefully about what they're doing. And I, I'm going to continue to just try and set out, as Jason has done also today, we're not asking you to do or rather not to do certain things for good reason. And I think if we can set out, as I've done with not getting into your parents' house to use the toilet if you've travelled a long distance, it's because that's where the risks of the virus will be greatest. Indoors, leaving it on surfaces, being within two metres of people so that you might be uh, sneezing and, and giving it to them that way. We'll, we'll try and set out the rational basis for what we're doing. But ultimately... Just as actually the last three months have come down to, the last two months have come down to, it's going to take people doing the right thing and trying not to do the wrong things. Uh, we'll all get it wrong at times, but if, if we keep in mind, this is all about protecting ourselves and our loved ones. And the last thing any of us want to do, um, I'm desperate to see my parents like everybody else is, but the last thing I want to do, and I know everybody's the same here, is put my parents at risk uh, by inadvertently potentially passing them the virus. So this is about that collective sense of doing the right thing. Every individual decision we take right now has an impact on our collective well-being. Um, I'm a great believer in collective spirit and collective endeavor anyway, but it's never been more important than it is right now. None of us are you know, individuals in, in that sense. All of, the, uh, all of what we do can have an impact on others and we've got to remember that. Uh, Chief. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, I think undoubtedly it, it was concerning uh, looking at the, the surge of people <laughs> who, who had gone down uh, to the promenade and, and, and the beach at Portobello. But th those of us who know the area uh, know that it, it is a long area for, for walking and, and for cycling. Um, people were actually spending a lot of time walking uh, on, on the beach. Uh, and, and our judgment around it was that there was very few of the people who were there were, were, were there maliciously or were there because they thought they were deliberately uh, flouting uh, the regulation. So we went down, a number of our officers went down and explained. I think there was a, a, a picture that may have been carried in your own paper, Vivian, it certainly uh, carried a number of pictures where there's a, a young officer standing with, with his hands open, almost pleading to people, saying, look, not now, you've come too early. Uh, you, you, you are allowed to exercise, but you're not allowed to come and spend as much time. And, and I would just reiterate the First Minister's comments that, that it's for people to look uh, to themselves, uh, to look to, to them and their families about their own behaviours and, and do the right thing. Again, I reiterate what I said earlier, not because you're going to get a criminal justice sanction. Criminal justice sanctions are, are, will make a contribution, a small contribution, 
to what the country needs to do. Uh, but follow the rules, follow the guidance, because it's the right thing to do to keep the whole of the country safe. Thank you. Uh, Muir Dickey from the FT. First Minister, uh, is it your expectation, based on the scientific advice, that this roadmap will take us to phase four, even if we don't have an effective vaccine or treatment or indeed herd immunity? Um, I don't know that yet, Muir, uh, is the, again, the kind of atypical uh, answer for a politician. I, I don't know that for sure. What, what I do know is that if we get a vaccine or if we uh, get effective treatments, then we get to phase four more quickly and all of us want that to be as quick uh, as possible. Short of that, I'll hand over to Jason, who, who will be able to give you a more clinical uh, answer to this. But short of that, you know, can we get to a point where the virus is so suppressed that we are so confident we can keep it suppressed through test and trace that we could effectively go back to normal. But even then, social, physical distancing is going to be important. So these are some of the things I cannot answer definitively right now. What I can answer definitively is I really, really hope that the, the very clever scientists working on this get that breakthrough and find the vaccine quicker uh, than perhaps uh, all of us may maybe think it will be. So uh, we just have to learn as we go and, and judge these things as we go as best we can. Let me uh, uncharacteristically join you and say I don't know either. So, so we, we simply don't know the answer to, to that in the sense that we don't know what the science is going to do. I can give some hope. There are over 200 vaccine trials in the world today. Three of them, at the last, at the last time I looked, have gone to phase two, and one of them is heading to phase three, which is human trials. They will probably fail, those ones, because early ones often do. But that would suggest to me that the science, the funding, the collaboration around the world is working well. And if a, if a vaccine is possible, remember, we don't even know that. If a vaccine is possible, then it will come just as quickly as it can, probably quicker than any other vaccine in history. Then we have to, of course, do supply. We have to test it in vulnerable groups to see if it's safe to do it. Treatment gives me slightly more hope. There are so many treatment trials going on around the world just now that I think something in there will be found to help us. I don't think it will probably be any of the things we yet talk about because most of them are failing. But in the end, I think we will get somewhere. And then there are antibody trials, antibody tests around the world, which are beginning to show some level of antibodies in the blood. And over time, we will know if that gives us human beings with immunity going forward. And the fourth hope is that we will suppress the virus to such a low level that we will be able to give advice that says tracing outbreaks and stopping those outbreaks is now enough to advise the decision makers to do things differently. That, that will be the point at which, even without treatment, we're able to do that. And we do that with other diseases just now. We don't have a vaccine for Ebola, but we don't limit Scotland's freedoms because of Ebola, because it's such a low level in the world that we can carry on as if it weren't there. That, that, that would be the fourth level of hope in that conversation. And the other thing to remember is Scottish scientists, clinicians, universities uh, are, are really involved in all of this work. We've had uh, the news you may have seen today about Glasgow University's participation in vaccine trials. So right across the world, uh, you know, the best brains are working really hard on this, which would give all of us hope. But until we get there, we need to just keep doing the, the, the only things we do know that can suppress this virus, which is all the things that we stand here every day and talk about. Uh, Severin Carell from The Guardian. Uh, good afternoon, First Minister. Um, it's just emerged from today's uh, Downing Street briefing that the Prime Minister is, um, could well visit uh, President Trump next week. I'm just wondering if you have any suggestions about what the Prime Minister should say to uh, President Trump, and any questions that you would ask. Um, I've, I've not seen that, that news, and um, yeah, I don't know whether, whether that's definite or, or not. Um, <sighs> I'm not, it's not for me to tell Boris Johnson what he should ask uh, Donald Trump. If, uh, I think all of us, and I, I say this not just as, as a leader of a government, I say this as a citizen. I, I would like to see the President of the United States uh, in his demeanour uh, and, and public utterances around uh, the dealing with this virus be just a little bit more responsible in, in the messages he's given. Um, we laugh sometimes about, you know, previous comments about disinfectant and 
you know, some of the comments he's made recently about testing, but it is so important that uh, leaders give, we all make mistakes and we all get things wrong, uh, all of us, but that we give clear um, advice and messages to people and we try to base that on the best knowledge, science and information that we've got. And I think that's a, a responsibility for leaders at the best of times, but it is such a, an important responsibility at times like this. So maybe a, a bit of an encouragement um, to, to think about uh, the importance of that would, would not go amiss. But um, I'm, I'm not sure what the purpose of the, the visit is or, or whether he would be going physically uh, at this time or not. So no doubt I'll catch up on that news later on. Uh, Michael Blackley from the Daily Mail. Hello, good afternoon. Um, just to return to the issue of family trips, um, the 100,000 people that you refer to downloading the route map uh, would be believing from reading it that all they can do is travel five miles to visit family and friends or any other leisure. But today you're obviously saying they can use their, their judgment. The, the new rule seems to be that they can travel as long as they're not going to go so far that they need to go to the bathroom. Um, uh, has uh, for such a key issue that a lot of people are wanting to find out about, is this not quite a bit of muddle and confusion on the message? And also for the chief constable, just on the five mile leisure travel rule, um, can we expect to see police out on dual carriageways and motorways uh, stopping people and asking where they're going and how far they're travelling? Uh, the Chief can answer that for himself. That would not be my intention as a, a policy maker to, to have the, the police uh, working in a way that, that requires that. Um, and that's just your first question. No, I, I don't agree. We, we set out a route map yesterday that sets the general direction of travel. I was very clear in Parliament, even for the kind of travel we're talking about for leisure activity, five miles is not a strict uh, limit. It's to give people guidance. And so much of this is about giving people guidance. And we will set out more of that before we actually lift uh, the restrictions and go into phase one as far as we can. And that, uh, in my judgment, is the kind of measured step-by-step -step way we should do things, rather than me standing up here one day and saying, we're lifting this restriction this afternoon. We set it out a bit in advance so that people get the general sense, we give a bit more detail, and then we lift it in a planned way. And I think that's the best, the best way of doing things. But, you know, I come back to this point as well. And, you know, for somebody like me, it's, this is harder as well as it is for the people listening to me. Um, as we move into this new phase, there will be much more personal choice involved and more personal judgment required. And my job is to try to set the parameters of that as, as much as we can in a practical sense. But also my job is to, you know, day after day for as long as it takes, try to build the understanding of why we're asking you to do certain things and not to do certain things. Um, and, you know, people like Jason have a big role to play in that as well. And I've always believed in this. If, if I treat you, the public, as the, the grown-ups you are, uh, furnish you with the information about you know, why we're doing certain things and not doing certain things, then you have the good judgment and the ability to do the right thing. And that is going to become more and more important. So I will try my best to be as clear as, as possible, recognising in all of this that sometimes the lines are not absolutely you know, firm and, and clear-cut, which is where personal judgment comes in for all of us. Do you want to add anything, Jason? Oh, sorry, no. no, the chief, rather. No. It was the chief that uh, the question was for. No, sorry. No, no. Th thank you. Um, I, th I think this gets to the heart of, of, again, some of the comments I made at the outset about the, the transition uh, to, to greater freedoms and greater liberties that, that, that people want um, and how much of that will be captured in changes to, to enforceable regulations and how much of that will be part of guidance and, and, and advice. In terms of stopping cars and asking people where, where, where they're going um, as we move out of, of different phases, the short answer would be no. I, I see it very similar to the suggestion that we would put roadblocks at the Scottish-English border. Um, I think it would be disproportionate. I think it could cause greater harm to the relationship between uh, the police and the public. Uh, and I think it would be excessively intrusive um, for uh, what we're seeking to do. Uh, I would base uh, my optimism on what we've seen thus far, which has been the vast, vast majority of people adhering to the guidance, uh, supporting each other uh, and making sure that they're doing the right thing. The police will always be there to give that encouragement. 
uh, but we won't be doing roadblocks or road checks. I don't think that would be the right thing to do. Chris Musson from The Sun. Hi, First Minister. Um, we're hearing, as maybe you have, that many um, working mums are shouldering most of the burden of childcare while schools are off. Perhaps as structural inequality means men are often better paid than women. So their jobs are perceived as being more important. And um, I just wonder, do you worry that mums could be forced out of their jobs given schools are off until August and part time indefinitely? And just secondly, related to this on em employment law, how can you make private sector employers offer flexible working such as the four day week? Sorry about this. Given the Scottish Government. Chris, I not. think you should let the other person in the room there ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> just given the Scottish Government has not got, <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm back. I'm just just checking. Given the Scottish Government has not got the financial the, the powers to force this on employers, um, is there a way that you can incentivise private sector employers any financial okay. support? Um, thank you. And can I first of all say you are clearly, as a man, taking your fair share of the childcare there. So uh, well done uh, for that. And hello to uh, hello. <laughs> Anyway, um, on your, your question, uh, we can't force, uh, well, we, we could if we regulated and, and uh, legislated, although in Scotland we are slightly limited because we don't have uh, power over employment law fully, but uh, I don't want to be in a position uh, generally here of, of forcing people to do things that we can get agreement around. So we want to have a discussion with employers about how we move to um, a more flexible working environment. And along the way, we will consider whether there's ways of supporting and incentivising that, um, because I think it is really important that we, we take the opportunity from that. And, and as we go, if there are things that we can mandate and feel that we should mandate, because that would be the proportionate thing to do, we, we don't rule that out. Uh, on the first part of your question, you're absolutely right. Not only will women have a disproportionate share of the childcare and homeschooling, although I should say I know a lot of men out there will be uh, doing their bit as well, but we know women shoulder more of that burden. It's also the case that women will have been disproportionately affected by aspects of this virus. More women work in health and social care, so may have been more exposed to the virus. Uh, women will often work in, in sectors where uh, they, they are more disrupted by this kind of thing. So both as we try to deal with the impact of this and support people to deal with the impact and move into an economic recovery uh, phase, that disproportionate and not always equal impact is something that we have to have very much at the forefront of our mind and will be a running theme uh, throughout all of this. So thank you for your question and, and my thanks to your uh, very able helper uh, there as well. Uh, Tom Peterkin from the PNJ. Good afternoon, First Minister. There's been a lot of concern that mandatory testing has not been rolled out sooner in care homes. Uh, Professor Andrew Morris of your government's COVID advisory group said that, that this was a policy decision when he appeared at the Scottish Affairs Committee. I, do you accept responsibility that testing was not done sooner in care homes and do you accept that it should have been done sooner? Um, well, firstly, just generally speaking, I accept responsibility for the Scottish Government's uh, decision making and response to this. I, I said earlier in the week and I think it's very important that politicians do. Uh, we are the decision makers. We, try, in, Particularly in a situation like this, we try to base, and I do, my decisions on the best science, the best advice and the best information. But ultimately, I and my ministers take the decisions and we are responsible and accountable for those. Uh, we will have got things wrong in this, but you know, often right now when people are uh, saying you got something wrong weeks ago, they are applying the hindsight of what we know now to that. Um, and these questions are important because that's how we learn. But we try to do the right things at the right time for the best reasons. And we've gone through many times before the evolution of our policy and testing in care homes, clinically driven as well as, yes, we've had to ramp up testing capacity, but we set out the reasons for that uh, and we will continue to do that. And we will continue to develop uh, these positions if the advice and uh, the clinical position says that that is important. Uh, David Ball from The Herald. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, at the last um, review of the lockdown on May the 7th, um, Scotland had a slightly higher R number than the rest of the UK, meaning it was um, 
unlikely that you could um, relax the uh, lockdown restrictions. Has that number now come down so uh, Scotland is on a par with the UK or have we got to the stage where it's maybe unrealistic to expect it to go further? And can I ask what advice you'd have for couples um, who live separately who will be meeting up for the first time um, and is it realistic for them not to sort of get too close as it were? Um, I'll come back to the second point in a moment. Um, on the first point, I, I covered the latest estimate of the R number in, in my statement to Parliament yesterday. We also, you may not have seen it yet, we published a paper yesterday uh, from uh, the statistician and experts about how we calculate the R number. And we will now publish the estimate of the R number every Thursday uh, for the duration of this crisis. The, the range of the R number hasn't changed in Scotland from our last estimate, so it's still uh, 0.7%. To one. We still think it could be slightly above uh, the rest of the UK. We, we don't have absolute certainty about that because of the confidence intervals and, and uncertainties that we all have uh, when it comes to calculating that number. But what we have much more confidence now uh, in is that it has been below one. We still don't know exactly how much below one, but it has been below one for at least three weeks. And some of the supplementary um, indicators that we look at, which is... Uh, case numbers, hospital admissions, ICU admissions and deaths, they are also showing a sustained and significant reduction. So that is what gives us confidence now to make the careful gradual steps forward that we set out uh, yesterday. I still think it would have been wrong for us to do that two weeks ago because we didn't have that confidence. Uh, and of course, now we are also in the position of being able to say next week uh, at the end of the month, as we ease these restrictions, we'll be able to start with test trace and isolate. So it's really important that we take these decisions in the, the way, sequence and on the time scale that is right for Scotland, which is what we'll continue to do. Do you want to say any more? Only that, remember not to put all the emphasis on R. It's the basket of measures that the First Minister has just outlined. I think Wednesday's National Register of Scotland data was hugely important in that decision-making, where we had week three of a sustained reduction in mortality. Still tragic numbers, and, and I don't underestimate what that means to families across Scotland. But ICU numbers at their lowest level for weeks and three weeks of mortality reduction, along with that continued estimate of R, I think gave the advisors more confidence to be able to advise the First Minister and others that now was the time to start thinking about that. Yeah, and just in case you thought I was trying to avoid the second part of your question, I just momentarily forgot about it, so I will uh, now address that relatively briefly. Um, you know, couples who live apart, I mean, obviously I understand the, the difficulties and, and challenges of that, but for... Uh, this next phase, uh, we will still be asking, unfortunately, for people in different households uh, who are meeting up to stay two metres apart. Um, and I am, uh, of course, aware of the, the particular uh, difficulties and challenges that poses for, for couples. Uh, what I'd, I'd say is in all of this, in trying to give general advice, uh, we are very mindful of the particular circumstances that particular individuals or or family units will be in and also the particular circumstances of the shielding group and as we try to develop this advice we we can't we can't make policy for every individual uh, situation but we, we are very mindful of the need to, to take account of different situations um, and, and we'll continue to be as we we move forward um, so thank you uh, for that uh, Derek Keeley from the Courier Thank you, First Minister. Um, as you said earlier on, the route map references childcare reopening fully in phase three. But as far as I can see, there's no mention specifically of families who use grandparents or childcare. Um, from the document, it appears grandparents with young children where physical distancing is just possible will need to wait until phase four, many months from now, until they're able to see them. Uh, could you confirm, please, if that is indeed the case? And what would you say to those families who understandably be very upset by that situation? Um, look, it's a situation that really upsets me as, as well. You know, there's so many difficult aspects of this, you know, too many to, to list. But one of the most distressing aspects, and I've seen the impact of that in my own parents, is not being able to uh, be with grandchildren. And I don't want that to continue for any longer than possible. And, you know, we, we will try to run through these phases as quickly as, as we can, as quickly as the evidence allows. But I come back to the central point here. Older people are most at risk from this virus. 90% of the people who have died in Scotland of this virus and, and probably globally um, have been over 65. Um, 
And that just, I'm afraid, is the brutal fact at the heart of this. So asking grandparents and grandchildren not to be together again in that physical uh, way is about protecting grandparents. And I, I remember saying at an early stage of this and wondering if it was too dramatic, but then realising it wasn't, that no matter how difficult it is for grandparents not to be with their grandkids right now and not to hug their grandchildren, it is about trying to protect you and make sure you're around longer to see your grandchildren grow up. So I, I know this is difficult. You will be able, once we lift some of these restrictions and go into the next phase, to uh, sit in the garden with your grandkids again, but two metres distance for this next phase. And, and I know how practically difficult that will be, particularly with young children, but it is for your protection. And we won't ask you to continue to restrict your normal lives any longer than we feel it is necessary. That's the, the commitment I give. Uh, Andrew Learmont from The National is the last of our questions today. Thanks, Mr Minister. I want to ask about test and protect, if that's all right. Uh, are you able to share how you'll be defining a contact under test and protect? Uh, will it be everyone whom a confirmed case has been in, uh, around, or will we have a specific sort of set of rules? Um, and will every person who is defined as a contact, will they be told to isolate for 14 days, uh, even if they have no symptoms? And uh, do you have any worries about people complying with that? And will that be uh, a role for police there? Will there be a change to, to regulations? Well, well, we'll set out more about Test and Protect as we get uh, closer to that point at the end of the month where we are uh, having this operational in all 14 health board areas. We'll be doing a lot of public uh, messaging and, and advertising around that because it's really important that the public understand it. Um, and so the you know exactly what the, the, the journey will be for the person with symptoms who's tested and then the implications for contacts, that will all be set out. And of course, if somebody uh, has symptoms and is tested and turns out to be negative, then you know their contacts no longer need to continue to isolate for 14 days. But it's really important that the public understands this. The definition of a contact uh, right now is somebody that's been within two metres for 15 minutes uh, or more. But of course, as our knowledge of this uh, virus develops, it may be that that changes over time, but we have to operate on the basis of the, the best science and information we've got at the time. Jason, do you want to? Uh, right. That's correct. We, we will try and be as open and transparent as we can with the public. This is going to be quite a difficult communication challenge. We're going to be asking people to do different things. And then once you find that index case, when that index case has symptoms and a positive test, we will then be asking people to do something. They may, they may not even know that index case very well. So it won't be just people you randomly pass in the street. Let's be very clear. You do have to have been with people for, as the First Minister says, a period of time and within a certain distance. And just now we're thinking that will be two metres and 15 minutes. So it won't be people you randomly walk past when you're exercising, but then you will be asked to stay home. If that test comes back negatively, then you will then be released. If you get symptoms, of course, you will then be traced yourself. You will then be index case again, and the tracing goes on from there. It's, it's complex, it will be clinically led, and it will be done confidentially by public health professionals and administrators who will help them. This will not be a big public exercise where everybody will know everybody else's contact details. It will be done as a clinically led, National Health Service led contact trace that they're used to doing. And that's the point. Public health experts are experienced in this. This is going to happen on a bigger scale, obviously. But the core uh, skills uh, and expertise remain the same uh, here. And the last point I would make, uh, which you, you alluded to as well, it, when we're potentially asking people to isolate for 14 days, maybe more than once, it's really important that we put support in place for people who would need it. And so that's a key part of the operation that we are developing right now. So uh, we've been supporting people in the shielded category. Some of the principles of that will help us to support people uh, who might be asked to isolate. But we'll set out more of this and there will be you know, a very careful uh, public information campaign so that everybody knows exactly what is going to be required of them. Um, that concludes the questions we've got today. Um, thank you all for joining us. My uh, thanks to the Chief Constable, particularly for joining us today. My thanks to Jason uh, and to Rachel, our uh, sign language interpreter for today. But particularly thanks to you, uh, not just for uh, tuning in today, but for everything you're doing to get us to the point where we can, uh, for the first time in uh, possibly three months, look forward now with a, a little bit of optimism. Cautious optimism, but optimism nevertheless. So please... Uh, 
stick with the rules this weekend because if we all do that this weekend then we are increasing the chances of me standing here uh, next Friday and saying that you have a bit more freedom to see people that you love than you do this weekend so please stick with it because you are helping to suppress the virus, protect the NHS and save lives. Uh, the Health Secretary will uh, lead the weekend briefing on Sunday and I'll be back here with you on Monday at 12.30. In the meantime, uh, try to have uh, as good a weekend as it's possible to have in these circumstances. Thanks very much.